Good morning, Presbyterians. In your bulletin, you will find some flyers today. One is about the Community Bridge Open House, and that still goes on from 1230 to 2 today. There's also a flyer about flowers for Easter. So if you're interested in that, please refer to those. Today is Sensibility Sunday, so have your loose change and designated gifts ready for the offering. There are other announcements of special interest. River Lawn will be hosting the community Lytton service this Wednesday at noon. So if you wish to, please make plans to attend that. Did anyone here have Latin class in high school? Ah, okay. Yeah, I had Latin, and I think even then it was considered a dead language, but it carries through to today because there's so many words that go back to that, and they'll say, well, this was derived from the Latin, whatever. We had a really good class in high school because of the teacher. Uh, that was Mrs. Atkinson, and she really had a, a fever for Latin and what went with it. She made the class interesting. In the springtime, we had a Roman banquet, and there was dress somewhat similar to what would have happened in Rome at that time, and food the same. It was not a toga party. <laughs> Uh, there was no, no music. Otis Day and the Nights were not there, no other music. But it was a good time, and when you were an underclassman your first year, you were a slave. And the other upperclassmen, then the second year students, could say, well, go get me grapes, go do this, get me something to drink, and you had to do that. Of course, the next year, you were in that uh, position of power. But again, it was something that was looked forward to. In our Latin class, she taught us the Lord's Prayer in Latin. At Christmas time, we sang Christmas songs and even hymns in Latin. Adeste Fidelis, O Come All Ye Faithful. Wow, can you imagine the schools doing that today? But it was quite interesting. This Sunday is Leterie Sunday, and that is my Latin probably terribly pronounced. <laughs> but it is a Sunday of joy. Now, here we are in Lent, and Lent is somewhat a very serious time, but on this particular Sunday, we actually look ahead and rejoice at what will come on Easter Sunday. Uh, last Thursday was the halfway point of Lent, so now we're heading into the last half. On this Sunday, uh, the liturgical collar is purple, but there is some variance, as some parishes and churches will use rose today. It's a break from the purple. It gives special note to, again, what lies ahead of us. It's a reminder of the coming days of Easter, and it's a reminder of the joy that we will receive when we one day come to our own heavenly kingdom. So this is a Joy Sunday. Joy fills our lives when we center our lives on Jesus Christ. Hope fills our hearts when we focus on the Savior. Comfort fills our spirits when we believe in the Lord. Peace fills our souls when we seek to do God's work. Come, let us celebrate and praise our Lord. Thank you. 
Please stand if you are able and join in the singing of our first song, There is a Redeemer. To come before God with the truth of our lives is itself an act of faith. We trust that the Holy One is interested in us, interested in our minds and hearts and souls. We trust that God's mercy and grace are intended for us too. With faith and in trust, let us make our confession to God, first in silent prayer. Holy God, hear our prayer. Sometimes our lives are a mess because of the choices we have made or because of choices others have made. Sometimes our lives are great and we're kind and generous. Sometimes our lives are great and we forget to be grateful and humble. We trust that in the jumble of all of this, you are present. We trust that you are with us, walking with us when we stray, nudging us back to the right path, slowing us down when we get ahead of you, and waiting for us when we lag behind. 
We thank you and ask for your forgiveness and pray that you will stay with us. Amen. Friends in Christ, know this, the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, and you are reminded of his surpassing grace. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You may be seated. <coughs>
Good morning, church. Let's turn to God's word this morning. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 31. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. The word of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Holy Spirit, come and give us eyes to see. Grant us your illumination, your sight, to not only see, not only to comprehend, not only to acknowledge and affirm, but you may equip and empower that we might live likewise. That as the crowds did, we may praise you. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Stevie Wonder and Jack Nicholas the golfer, they had much in common. A singer, a golfer, they were actually sitting around the pool one day talking. Inevitably, the conversation turns to golf. Nicholas is surprised to hear that Stevie's a golfer. He's blind, but he's been playing golf for years. And the golf pro, he can't believe this, so he wants some of these details, so Steve explains how he does it. Well, my caddy stands out in the middle of the green and he shouts out from the fairway, calls to me, and I listen to the sound of his voice and I play toward the sound of his voice. Then when I get to where the ball lands, it moves further down the course and does the same thing again and again. Well, Nicholas, he's obviously impressed, but then he asks, well, how do you putt? Well, the singer replies, well, I get my caddy to lean down in front of the hole and to call with me, just his mouth close to the cup. I just play the ball toward his voice. Again, Nicholas is astounded. He finds this very amazing. And then he asks me, you know, we really should play around sometime. Great, that'd be wonderful. Nicholas says, well, when should we play? And Stevie says, you name the night. Smart man. You know, this morning I'd like us to talk about another blind man. But instead of being a a talented golfer, a famous musician, this guy, this guy was wiped out on life. Because he was not able to see, he spent his days 
years by the roadside, by the city gates, just waiting for someone to give him a shekel or a piece of bread. This was his life. Before we meet this blind man, I want us to really get an understanding of this context, the significance of this, uh, the context surrounding this event. So let's look again at that first part of the passage, those first verses that we read, because here we read that Jesus is walking to the cross. And that's significant. He's walking to Jerusalem in order to accomplish what he came to do. If you didn't catch it the first time, here are the verses again. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going to Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. And the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. What's interesting is, is this is the third time already in Luke's gospel that Jesus predicts his impending death. And each time he tells the disciples what is to come, he gets more explicit, but they don't get it. What's interesting, if you read through the gospel of Luke, you'd notice that beginning in chapter 9, there is this major shift in Jesus' orientation that we're really introduced to a travel motif of sorts that permeates the remainder of the book. And this is really what marks our journey through this season of Lent. Let's take a quick look back, see what I'm talking about, okay? Chapter 9, verse 51. As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. 13.22, then Jesus went through the towns, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. 13.33, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. 17.11, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And now we arrive at our passage where Jesus takes his disciples aside and tells them once again, we are going to Jerusalem. That without a doubt, Jesus is on a mission. That he's headed to the place where he is going to die as the one true ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. That's what sets the context. We can't miss that. So moving on to verse 35, we see that Jesus is now approaching the city of Jericho. Uh, it, was, it was a blessing to be, able to, uh, to be able to be close to Jericho when uh, my brother and I went to the Holy Land uh, about a year ago now. Uh, and just to be able to be in the places that we know that our Savior went to. And so now Jericho is about 15 miles from his final destination. The Jews from around the, the, the known world were traveling to Jerusalem for the Passover, and they would be stopping here. They would need to rest before that final leg of the journey. And so as Jesus heads into, into Jericho, he meets a blind man. Do we know his name? Anyone, anyone? It's not said in our text, but Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus. We see that from the, the Gospel of Mark. So if I accidentally, well not accidentally, if I, I happen to use Bart instead of Bartimaeus, it's the same guy, okay? So as we take a closer look at this incredible encounter, we can observe at least four different things that Bartimaeus goes through these stages which I think also apply to us as we encounter the dying and the living Christ in this season of Lent. The first stage is his blindness. His blindness. He's described simply as a blind man sitting by the roadside begging. In a lot of other accounts, he never would have been mentioned. Seems to be a detail that would have easily have been just not acknowledged. Blindness, common problem in Palestine. And while Leviticus 19 says that God's people were to care 
for those who are blind. There was a cultural and religious stigma against blindness. And we see that especially in another account of a man who was healed of his blindness. In the Gospel of John chapter 9, the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind? Who sinned, this man or his parents? And so it was a common thought that those who were blind deserved their blindness. Many people believe that blindness was a consequence of sin. And so those who were blind were often ignored or ostracized, discarded, or at least neglected. Because Bartimaeus was blind, he was downgraded to a life of begging. He would just sit there day after day. He knows that there is nothing that he can do. He knows that there's nothing that he can do to improve his condition. All that he can do is wait for something good to come his way. And I think this picture of Bartimaeus is a really good word picture for our spiritual condition, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That if we do not know the gospel of Christ, if we have not encountered the living of Christ, then we continue to live in spiritual darkness. Blind to the truth of our desperate need. And on our own, there is nothing we can do to change that. Nothing. We're just like Bartimaeus. So just as Jesus gives sight to those who are physically blind, we need to never take for granted that he also grants spiritual insight to those who live in spiritual and moral darkness. And that is all in this world. Bartimaeus knew that he was blind. He could not deny it. And so the first thing we need to do is admit that without Christ, we are just as blind spiritually as this man was physically. So let's take a look at verse 36 now. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. You know, Bartimaeus, he's a pretty smart guy. He knew that there would be a, a mass of people going to Jericho that day, all on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So that's why he's sitting on the side of the road with his hand stretched out. Now, he couldn't see what was happening, but he could hear the commotion. He could hear the excitement. And so he's curious. Perhaps he's heard some unusual comments about a healer who'd headed to Jerusalem. Verse 37 gives the answer to his question. Jesus of Nazareth. That's interesting. Okay, the people, the crowd, says Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So Bart's heart begins to race. Could it be that that same person that he's heard such marvelous things about is right before him, right in front of him now? It's almost too good to be true. And so the first stage is his blindness. The second thing we notice is his belief. Notice how he addresses Jesus in verse 38. He immediately calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Notice the contrast. The crowd refers Jesus of Nazareth, earthly heritage. A man, this is where he's from. That just tells us where he grew up. That's like someone telling you that I'm from Western PA, Pennsylvania. That's what we call PA, you know. It may give you a hunch about a few things, but it doesn't tell you everything about me. That's not what Bartimaeus calls him. Instead of calling Jesus as a guy from Nazareth, he announced his messianic heritage. There's no doubt about it. He is the son of David, the anointed one, the one that the Old Testament has been pointing to as the coming deliverer, that this blind man could see he could see that this Jesus is more than just a man from a small town up north, even in his blindness. Now, this is the chosen one sent from heaven to be their savior. He has this belief. So when Mark calls out to the son of David to have mercy on him, he was expressing his belief in Jesus as Messiah and that he could heal his blindness. He knew who Jesus was and he knew what Jesus could do. And so the question for us is, 
Do we believe in this Jesus? Do we believe that he is the Lord of life? Do we believe that he is savior of the world? Do we truly believe in his power, power to heal our hearts and our souls, power to set us free from whatever is keeping us down, anything that is holding us back, whatever we may be enslaved to in this world? The thing is, we need to cry out just like Bartimaeus. And in this time of Lent, let us examine ourselves. Let's not take this time for granted. Where have we fallen short? What is our need? And then let us put our trust in the healer and in his power to restore. Let's respond like Bartimaeus. Okay, so Bart was aware of his blindness and his belief in Jesus was right on, but he did more than just believe. He acted on what he knew to be true with his boldness. His boldness. Barton knew that he needed mercy because there's nothing he could do on his own. And so he calls out to Jesus. He yells. Verse 39, we see that this bothered some others in the crowd. That shouldn't surprise us. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. This may not be that foreign to us. The people there may have been important. They may have been city officials. They wanted Jesus and his followers to see how beautiful their community was, maybe. They were probably embarrassed, even irritated, when they heard this blind beggar shouting and carrying on, so they tried to shut him up. But then comes the rest of the verse. He shouted all the louder, all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. This is a bold move for a blind man. He was breaking all the cultural rules of etiquette, but for him it didn't matter. He could not let Jesus get away. Nothing else mattered. This was his chance and he seized it. And so again, we, we consider ourselves. I wonder if we have that same kind of boldness when it comes to calling out for divine help. Do we have that boldness? Maybe we don't because we really don't understand our condition, our blindness. Maybe we don't because we fear Jesus won't do anything about it. Or maybe we're just blind to our need. Or we don't care about it. Or we become callous about it. Do we think less of Jesus or his power to restore than we should? Hebrews 4.16 tells us to approach the throne of grace with confidence, to come boldly, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Friends, don't hold back. Don't be afraid to come before Jesus with your need, to give yourself over to him. Come to him boldly. Come to him with confidence. Pour out your heart to him. That's what he wants from us. His grace is always there for us in our time of need. His word has proclaimed it again and again. He's displayed it in our lives again and again. And so as a result of Bart's boldness, Jesus stops. And he orders some guys, maybe the same ones who had just rebuked the blind man. I say it's probably a good chance to help him walk through the crowd so that he is face to face with the Messiah. Everyone else can see that in the moment. Bart can't yet. I, I picture things getting very quiet. What thoughts were going through the minds of these people as they just stood there watching? And so Jesus asked Bartimaeus a question. What do you want me to do for you? Well, isn't it obvious? It's clear to all that this blind beggar wanted to be healed. Was Jesus not sure? No. Jesus knew what he wanted. But he asked the question for Bartimaeus' sake. And not just Bartimaeus, but for the crowd of people as well. Jesus wanted him to verbalize it, to confess his need, and to accept Jesus' power to heal. And Bart doesn't flinch. Lord, I want to see. He doesn't flinch. He, he calms with that. What about us? What is the cry of our heart? 
Are you going to Jesus with your deepest needs, your deepest needs? Do you cling to his mercy to bring about your healing, your restoration? We continue to need that. Maybe you used to do that regularly, but maybe it's gotten pretty rare lately. Or maybe you've never experienced it. Maybe you need to ask Jesus to heal you and to deliver you from spiritual blindness today. And if so, Jesus is waiting for you, just as Bartimaeus. Call out to him to boldly ask the one who can heal to give the healing that only he can give. And I pray that you do, that we all do, that we all continue to go to the one who is healed. So that brings us to the last one. This is the, saves the best for last. So once we admit our blindness, once we place our belief in Jesus as Messiah, we can come boldly with our requests. That leads to the fourth thing that happens. We receive a blessing. Verse 42, Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received sight and he followed Jesus, praising God. Did you catch that? Blessing is not for our benefit, even though it is. That's why we're blessed. It's a blessing to us, but ultimately it leads to praise to God. When Bart, Bart got his sight back, he couldn't help but break into praise. He was overjoyed. That is how we should respond to God's blessings in our life. Those noticed and sometimes those that go unnoticed. There are other blessings that sometimes we don't even notice, but we still need to praise God knowing that he has blessed us. Now, these verses do not teach us that we'll be blessed with whatever we ask for. No, we know better. But they do teach us what we don't want to miss is that Jesus responds to our faith. He responds to our faith. Bartimaeus put his faith in Jesus and he received his sight. That when we put our faith in him, he responds to our deepest need. He heals us from the inside out. He gives us spiritual sight. He brings us out of the darkness. That's what he does. That is what he came to do. That is what he accomplished. That is what he continues to do for us. Bartimaeus went from darkness to light, from begging to following, from crying to praising. And his blessing then led to the blessing of others as those around him began to praise God too. Kingdom God exhibited, expanded, Bartimaeus is a picture of what Jesus wants from all of us. He wants us to recognize our blindness, to believe that he's the cure, to come to him boldly with our plea, and to praise him for the blessing he bestows. In him is found forgiveness and healing and new life. So Bartimaeus, he seizes the moment, and now it's our turn. So let's come boldly. Let us cry out for his mercy and his healing, that kind that only comes from our Savior. And let us cling to Christ, for he has suffered and died and risen for you. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, we give you the praise. We thank you that you came that you came and you healed the blind and that you also restored even greater sight or spiritually blind in this world, in this age. You're the one who grants us new eyes, new sight. Lord, I pray with those this morning who may be like Bartimaeus, and this is the first time crying out, knowing that you are the son of David, you are Messiah, you are healer. And so we come with the one thing you want from us, faith, dependence, surrender. And we pray that you will do what only you can do, that you will heal, that you will restore. Lord, we pray this for our lives, not merely for ourselves, but so that we will praise you and that others will praise you as well. 
may you be given all the glory and we pray in the name of Christ, risen and reigning. Amen. We've been given another word picture. Not only can we think of Bartimaeus as the one who was given physical sight to know that Jesus is the one who gives us spiritual sight, but we come to this table just as Jesus had with his disciples that last supper in that upper room, and we're reminded not just of bread and of a cup, but of his body and his blood given for you and given for me. He was resolute to go to Jerusalem where he knew that he would be offering himself up, his very life, his very blood for you and for me. And so that is what we remember. That is what we thank God for. That is how we commune with one another this morning as we celebrate this gift that God has given us through his son. If you have not received communion with us before, we want you to know we will be distributing the elements. You are invited to take a piece of the bread. When we've all received, we'll partake together. We'll do the same with the cup. And this is the Lord's table. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's the Lord's. So all are invited to come. All those who are just like Bartimaeus, aware of their great need and crying out to the one who answers and heals. And so I want to, want to invite the uh, elders to come forward at this time. And again, this is a time to prepare our hearts in this season of Lent. A time for not only repentance, but a time of thanksgiving, a time of faith. And that we, we may be like Bartimaeus, crying out and trusting him. So let's pray. Lord, prepare us for this. Prepare our hearts and give us eyes to see what you've done, what you were doing, the sacrifice that you made, and the communion that we have with you even now in this moment. We rejoice in that greatest of gifts. We come, we turn from sin, we acknowledge our desperate need, we cry out to you, and you are the one who heals. We praise you for your grace, and we partake of these gifts knowing that it is only because of you. And we pray this in the name of Christ, our Lord, amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he blessed and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat with thanksgiving. same way after dinner, Jesus took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. shed for you, take and drink with thanksgiving. As often as we eat the bread, as often as we drink the cup, we proclaim our Savior's sacrificial death for us and his resurrected life for us until he returns. Thanks be to God.
as we continue to worship. We have received in many ways, and now we have opportunity to give through tithes and offerings, expressions of our love, our faith, our joy, and our thanks. Let us give to the Lord. All right, well, let us pray together. Lord, we come before you, we give you the praise, and we thank you that we can come to you with all things, that we can approach your throne of grace, and that you will respond with, in response to our need, and our need is great. And so, Lord, we lift up those that we've mentioned. Lord, we pray for those who are mourning. We pray for those who are ill, who are fighting cancer. We pray for those who, um, who are fighting it again. We pray for your strength and your peace, your encouragement, your healing power. Lord, we pray for those who may be nearing the, the end of their season of life, but we thank you that this is not all there is. This is just the beginning. 
for those whose hope is in you. And so we pray that we will have our eyes set to the eternity that you have created for us because of Jesus. And so, Lord, may we be a people of that living hope, proclaiming it, resting in it, praising you for it. Lord, we pray for not only those uh, that we have heard who are struggling, but those on our hearts or even ourselves that we haven't vocalized and those just down the road from us. Show us how we can be those who express your compassion, your your restorative power, your blessing, your hope. And Lord, we give you praise for the ways you are working, for the testimonies that we have heard, for the opportunities that we have. And we pray that by your grace, you will compel us, that the love of Christ and the life of Christ will compel us to be able to be those who praise your name and encourage others too as well. We thank you for the vision you've given us and the life that you've given us. And may we be those who are grateful and those who respond to it in love. And we pray all these things in the name of our Savior, the Messiah, Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. Church, we continue to worship So let us stand and sing and believe and rest in the victory in Jesus, verses 1 and 2.
want to thank you for worshiping with us today. We hope to have many opportunities to fellowship and worship with you to come through this season of Lent and then Easter until the Lord calls us home, until he comes for us. And so we want to invite you to a time of fellowship in the gymnasium following the service. Again, there's a little mini display of uh, items from the community bridge. Uh, you don't have to be there right at 1230. It's all the way till 2. So again, we encourage you to uh, check out the community bridge open house. Uh, and we hope you can join us on Wednesday for the Lenten service and luncheon. And if you have a need of prayer, if something's on your heart you want to talk about, if you want to know more about this Jesus who gives sight to the blind and life to the dead, we'd be overjoyed to talk or to pray with you. And now receive this benediction from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as we remember the one who illumines, who brings light where there's darkness. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for we know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But you, you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. Believe it and live it to the glory of God. Amen.